day. Let's stand together, please, with our songbooks. Let's sing together. Page number 28. Page number 28, please. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, God, my Father, let's sing to the glory of God. Lift it up. Sing it from your heart. Page number 28 on the first together now. Great is thy
singing, what a joy it is to be in God's house with God's people. And I trust you anticipate Sundays. And I got up this morning so excited about yeah. being here and looking forward to what God has in store for us. But it's already been worth being in church to hear the choir opener and then to sing Great is Thy Faithfulness uh, with you this morning. Aren't you glad He's faithful even Amen. when we're not faithful? And uh, our, I'm grateful we serve a risen Savior today. And may God use this service to prepare our hearts for next weekend to see a great host come to Christ as their Lord and Savior. And we're delighted to have each and every one of you here. We, we welcome our online guests as well. And we're looking to the Lord to do great things. What a tremendous crowd this morning. And uh, may God bless us this week to do great things for Him and see a great harvest of souls. So let's pray to that end that God will work in our midst. Father in heaven, we're so thrilled to be in your house this morning. We thank you for the precious people that you have brought to North Valley Baptist Church. And God, we're asking your touch upon this service. May every aspect be marked by your presence. And God, may you receive the glory for what is accomplished in every heart today. I pray, Lord, for those that don't know Christ, may they come to know Jesus Christ personally. And then, Lord, for those of us who do, we're so thankful that you're faithful to us. May we be full of faith and faithful to you. May we reach the multitudes, Lord, with the gospel message. The power is in the gospel. And may we be obedient, Lord, uh, to the command to tell others about you. Anoint the preaching of your word in a special way. And I pray, God, that your word would have free course in every heart and life. And may you accomplish your will today in this service. And we'll be careful to give you the glory and the praise. For we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing.
What a friend for sinners. Page number 53 in your songbooks, please. Our great Savior, as the choir joins us, let's sing it together. Page number 53, please. Lift it up. Sing that first together now. Uh, Jesus, what a
This Saturday, we're going to be reaching thousands upon thousands upon thousands of boys and girls and moms and dads on our Easter in the park. We'll be preaching in parks all over the area, and it's exciting. Tell us about that third grade girl that went to Canton Baptist Temple so many years ago and her parents. Tell us about that story, will you please? Well, it was a family that you wouldn't think much about. They were a, a family that had smoking in the home and drinking in the home. And uh, there wasn't a whole lot of hope. The dad was an agnostic and the mom was unsaved. And uh, it was a Saturday morning, I believe, when a knock came at the door. And people invited them and they said, we want you to come to the Vacation Bible School here at Canton Baptist Temple. You're our cousin. We want you to come with us. And we'll get points if you come. And uh, so they came that morning uh, for Vacation Bible School. And that little girl trusted Christ as her Savior. And she was just a little young child, but uh, they came the next week and said, your daughter trusted Christ at the Vacation Bible School. And some of the pastors there from the church came and visited that home. And uh, lo and behold, that family all trusted Christ as Savior. Uh, the man that was an agnostic soon thereafter became very faithful to that church. And the, the lady that was a smoker, she became very faithful at church. And uh, they became deacons, and they worked in the uh, camp that, that that church hosted. And that lady, that young girl, grew up in that church and was married in that church. 
And uh, that, those, those folks that were reached by Canton Baptist Temple were my mom, my grandparents. And I'm so thankful that they were reached uh, by a vacation Bible school, by a big day. And this week, maybe we'll have the opportunity to go into these neighborhoods and find a family without hope. And maybe we'll be able to just leave a track on the door and invite them to come to Easter in the park. Maybe your labor will be what transforms another home and uh, sees another generation reached with the gospel. And I'm thankful that my home was reached many, many years ago. He didn't know I was going to call him. That grandfather passed away this week in Connecticut, and he'll have the joy to be there at his grandfather's funeral for a day and be back. But, you know, I never, I never knew that story until a couple years ago. But over 40 years ago, I met his grandfather and grandmother, uh, Christian school principal. I was preaching on the East Coast in New England area. I began to know them year after year as I went there. Little did I know that they would have a grandson in our college, and now that grandson grew up and he graduated, married. His wife was right here with him singing. They have three girls. One of their girls got saved last night at home, and it's just so wonderful. And God can change lives, and he wants to change lives. I want to encourage you to be active this week. The ushers have just five packets of these, and we're going to come through the house right now. It just says Easter. You know, I've been passing these out, and everywhere I pass them, people, oh, Easter Sunday, thank you. They're very gracious about it. And uh, take, take a stack. There's only five. You want more than that, you can get more. T take five and, and get them out. Everybody needs to take a stack. That's it, just to everybody. And uh, do what you can Amen. and invite people 1030 next Sunday morning and 6 o'clock next Sunday night. In the bulletin, and we're going to get those out in just a moment, up in the balcony. Thank you for being right there, uh, ushers. It's great. Next Sunday at 1030, by the way, this place will be packed. And we're excited about it. We'll run the buses on Saturday, the parks on Saturday. Some of our buses will perhaps run on Sunday, but they'll all be in here. And big family service uh, next Sunday. Let's get the bulletin out next, fellas, if you will. And with that bulletin, you can see all the announcements of the week. There's many. And we'll take time for some tonight. But 6 o'clock tonight, let's not forget the service. There's an insert, and uh, there's about 120 since we t uh, printed this, we had about four or five more come in. And uh, this is the President's Club. And some of these I know, I've I read them. It's not the way you'd want it on the plaque that hangs in the hallway. And so just give us the right information this week. Not next Sunday, Easter, but the following Sunday, we'll give a final uh, copy of this and say, is this the way you want it to look? And uh, if you want to be part of the President's Club, you can see an usher at the end of the service today, or you can go online and be part of that. That's a, a tremendous crowd. You support the college at $100 a month, and uh, that's just a big, big help to us. We're going to ask the usher to do one more item, and that's if you're visiting with us, we have a visitor brochure. We want to give it to you quickly, and it tells you about the ministry of this church. There's a card in the back. You can fill it out if you please, and to place it in the offering plate. Please pray for Sunday, next Sunday. You say, well, what about today? Well, I hope you prayed for today as well, but next Sunday is going to be great. I think of how Easter, seven years ago, Brother Chago there, Natalia, his husband and wife, they got saved on Easter Day and their family to us. And you just never know what God's gonna do. Pray for souls to be saved. Pray that our entire Christian faith rests on next Sunday. I thank God for the fact that our Savior, Jesus Christ, would be born of a virgin and come at Christmas, what we celebrate Christmas. Unto you is born this day a, a, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. But if he didn't go to the cross, we'd still be yet in our sins, First Corinthians. We'd be on our way to hell. And those that have loved ones that have died and are saved, uh, we, we would not have any hope to see them again, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15. But our, our entire Christianity is, is founded upon he had to conquer death. And he conquered death and will conquer death if you're saved. And so I, I hope that you'll be much in prayer. Choir, uh, in the midst of a busyness, we... Uh, not Sunday school next week, but it's a morning service at 10.30 and then Sunday night at 6. Get to the choir and let's pack it out. Orchestra, pack it out. Meet folks next week. Well, don't come in and sit down. Talk to people around you. Don't be overbearing, but, but be gracious to them. 
and uh, it will be great. We're prepared for the offering today. I don't have time to talk to you about it. Great, great needs. Ushers, please come. We're going to call Bron Luke Fanera. Luke Fanera. <laughs> Chris Flood. Um, <laughs> my wife says I have that AD, whatever it is, and uh, I also have dyslexic, and I do, I guess. Oh, I mix things up. When, if you ever notice when a preacher says, let's read together, I just mouth the words because I put this word down here, up here, and it's a mess. I told my class this morning, I agree with her finally that I'd have this AD, whatever you call it. What is it? ADHD. That's what it is. My kids have been making such fun of me and laughing because when I preach, they say, if you see a psalm book, the guys go down and the psalm book's out of order. While you're preaching, you straighten it. I said, I don't do that. They said, has anybody ever seen me do that? No. Are you go over here and straighten that, that thing right there drive me crazy. That, that church house is not right. Has anybody ever seen me? He said, you just did that. So I got a lot of other problems. One of these weeks I'm going to preach to you. The sixth, sixth Sunday of next, year, of month, next month, I'm going to preach about all my problems in life. We're in Colossians chapter 3 today, uh, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. I want you to pray for next Sunday. Right here, this would be a great text with the risen Savior. I just don't, I'm not comfortable with it yet. I, I've been asking God, I've studied so much, and I've got this area, and I don't know what message I'm preaching. Uh, but I'd like you to pray that God give me the right one. I, I, I'm willing to move from Colossians if I need to next week. I'm willing to stay with Colossians. But I want to know that God has spoken to my heart. And I'm so th thankful he sort of let me be a little restless. It makes me depend a little bit more upon him. I don't want to fail God. And I don't want to fail our people that bring people to the house of God next Sunday. Brother Flood, you're such a blessing. I, 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 I could not organize what he has organized for us. Over 7,000, eight, almost 8,000, I guess what it was, last year came on Saturday. And he is, he's got this thing organized. They'll be preaching and singing. And uh, he's got almost 100,000 eggs, I think 70,000 Easter eggs that are stuffed already and ready to go. Come and lead us in prayer, Brother Flood. I love you so much. So I'm th I thank God for you folks. I was preaching in Chicago one night this week. And I said, you know, I learned in 1977 to tell your people you love them. And I purposed that night that I would tell our church every Sunday night. But now I say it every service. I love this church. I love you people. And visitors are grateful you're here. Let's have a word of prayer for the offering, please. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we are so thankful for the opportunity to attend this church this morning. And Lord, be a part of your work in this opportunity now as we give our tithes and our offerings. Lord, just the privilege it is to give back to you. And God, it all belongs to you, but I pray that you would take the offering. I pray that you would, Lord, use it to further uh, the gospel. And as we try and as we strive and work, uh, Lord, to preach, I pray that you would fill us with your power. And God, please, I pray that you continue to use this church as we uh, continue to see more souls saved. And God, we thank you for how good and how good you are to us and how much you've blessed us. And God, I pray for the rest of the service this morning. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's take your Bibles and turn to the book of Colossians today. You've been very patient with me. We've been in this since the January 7th, the first Sunday. And I've, I've really enjoyed personally for me studying this book and uh, g- uh, gaining insight into my own personal life. And today we're in chapter 3 and uh, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. The Bible says, If ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, and not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your light is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye appear with him in glory. There are three tenses grammatical tenses, you saw them here. There's the past, the present, and the future. The first is past, if ye then be risen with Christ. And then we find the present. If that's the case in the past, well then presently, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. That's in the present. But look at the future. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. Our Christian faith always reveals itself in how we live. What you believe, what I believe is revealed how we behave. And I want us to carry that thought with us this week. What I believe, it's always revealed. I have a prayer journal and it's very extensive and I work with it and use it. And uh, I I don't want to portray that I'm this greatest prayer warrior. In fact, I was called upon to preach this week at a church about prayer. And I thought of all subjects because I can preach on a lot of different subjects and they're relatively easy. And I don't mean that disrespectful to God's word, but building or soul winning or family or home or our uh, uh, work ethic or serving God. But when they asked me to preach on prayer, I immediately went to prayer and said, God of all things, because without me you can do nothing. And I don't think there's a person here that believes they pray enough. But my job, I have been hired by the church, Acts 6, 4, to give myself continually to the Word of God and prayer. And so when I say I have a prayer journal, and it is extensive, and most of your names are on there for some reason or another, positive. Uh, all you that own businesses, your name is there. Uh, all of you that have physical needs, your needs are there. Your, your request is there. Some are praying for special needs in their home, and I try to clean them. I have the missionaries, and I have the deacons, and I have the ushers, and I have the Sunday school teachers, and the bus workers, and, and I have the staff, and I have people that have uh, great needs in their life. And I'm not saying I'm perfect at it. I can't get through it all in the morning uh, time. It just, it's too extensive. But one page I have, it just breaks my heart. And you know, because I've said in the past, is my backslidden page. As a pastor, it, it hurts me immensely to pray for someone who's away from God. And I feel like I have that duty. Some have not been back to church in years. I still feel like I have that duty. It's hard for me. It's very difficult for me to cross a name off. They've moved to another shepherd. I, I generally cross their name off because they have a new shepherd. 
but they were backslidden. It's hard for me to go through a line when someone passes away in our church and put a line through their name. In fact, my dad's been dead for years now. I can't take his phone off my phone. He doesn't have that phone anymore, but, but I just can't remove it. Brother Bobby Robertson, I, I, I can't remove his cell phone. And somebody has it because someone called me a few, about a year or so ago and said, Bobby Robertson. I thought, boy, is this from heaven or where's this coming from, you know? <laughs> Scared me a little bit, quite frankly, to death. But, uh, but I just can't remove it. We have members of our church that passed away, can't remove their phone. And I, I probably should. It's difficult. But I have a backslidden list to pray for. It hurts me. I've never told you this one. I have a list of those that claim to know Christ and I don't believe there's any salvation in their life at all. I think of a family that, that the mom and dad and the kids, I just honestly don't believe there's any evidence of salvation. And I'm going to give an account to God. Hebrews tells me I'm going to give an account to God for this church. Pastors all over America are watching right now, I'm sure, and around the country. They could say a lot of times people that leave the church, uh, some aren't leaving, they're really good Christians. I'm not saying if you don't if you stay here, you're, some are very great Christians. Many go in the ministry others serving God in churches. And I go across the country, I have former members in churches. I went to, years ago, went to Dallas on a Monday night to preach. And there were 13 families, not all in the same church. They stood in line waiting and stood about an hour and I finally got to them, all of our former members serving God in other churches. The next week, I went to Florida and there were 13 families at WEC, they stayed in line. The next week, I was in Chicago and 13, 13, 13. And you know, many, just because they leave doesn't mean they're not saved or they're backslidden. But churches all over America, a lot of folks leave because they, they blame this. But the truth is, they have no knowledge of God. You know, when, when people are hateful and dissension and gossip and negativity and malicious and no works of righteousness, that's not Bible. If any man be in Christ, he's new, a new creation. And Paul is dealing with this church that got so mixed up in God's, the little g, with the almighty God. You know, I, I look at that list that I believe are, and I, I want Brother Panera, he's, he knows when I, if I die, first thing he does, he has to shred my prayer jar. I don't want anybody to ever see it. I don't want anybody to know what names are on there. But my Bible says in, in Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are the peacemakers. Listen to this. For they shall be called the children of God. There's evidence that you're saved. I, I preached in churches and I think of one lady came forward and it was a preacher's wife said, I need to get saved. Years ago. Well, that's a tough one. But Lost. You know, let me labor for a minute. Are you saved? I mean, you honestly, have you been born again? Do you know that you, you, Matt in our church, last Sunday he was here preparing the property, 44 years of age, and they found him passed away on Tuesday. No foul play. Rides that bike to church, you've seen him. 44 and gone. I'll tell you what, Matt got saved, you led him to Christ and baptized here. And, and even if he didn't get baptized, he's still on his way to heaven. But he's in heaven today. Why? Because somebody cared. Are you saved? You're going to have to come face to face. Every year in Bible college, we have young people coming from around the world to Bible college here, and they trust Christ as Savior. That doesn't bother us. We're excited about it, Pastor, when that happens. Good night, if some ch child or adult comes to assurance of salvation, it doesn't discourage me at all. I want, I want everyone to know that I know, that I know, that I know I'm saved. Amen. We have to plead with so many, please come to Sunday school, please come to church, please read your Bible. That's not Bible. There's a new desire. 
And, and Paul is dealing with this in, in chapter, uh, chapter three. It's, my message is a testimony of a true Christian. There is a testimony of a true Christian. And, and we see verse one, if, if, that's the key word, if, if is a connecting word. It connects chapter two to chapter three. Chapter two, what, remember, was speaking about uh, holy days, and it was speaking about rituals, and it was speaking about uh, the, uh, 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 all these things that were taking place. And, and, and in, in chapter one, uh, he justified us, he reconciled us, he's forgiven us, he saved us, all those words that happened. And so he says, in, in combination now, you add all that up, if, if those things really happen, or since they happened, since those things happened, the Bible says, then be risen with Christ. You know, something happened. Go back to verse 14 of chapter 2. The latter part, we saw this a week or two ago. Uh, 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 the Bible says the ordinances which are contrary to us. He took out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Verse 15, he, he, he spoiled principalities and powers and demonic powers, and he made a show of them. He triumphed over them. If that is what he did, verse 16, the, the holy days and things of that, and the new moon and how people follow astrology. And if he conquered all that, if ye then be risen with Christ, the second thought is then seek. Since this happened, secondly, seek. Look what he says in verse number one. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek. Seek is what God's word showed us. He gave us that story of a lost coin. And he sought for the coin. A lost son, he sought for the coin, uh, the son. And, and when, when we seek, it means to diligently search. I am the notorious one these days for some reason, I lose things. I'm waiting. <laughs> All old people <laughs> like me. I lose things, and it, I mean, I've told you this before. I was preaching somewhere else. Maybe I told mom, I'm not sure, but I, it was somewhere this week. I'm at my desk, and the man built me this thing that I have my desk here, and then I've got this 11-foot angled piece of wood that I can put books up there. I'm studying. I know I have not left my desk. I'm at my desk. I'm there. I have my cell phone there. And I need to do something with my cell phone, and it disappears. Some demon came into my office while studying and picked it up and took it somewhere else. I'm, I'm, it happened again this week. I said, I am not leaving this desk because I've not left this room. It's in here somewhere. I'm really under all the papers, and I'm pulling things out and moving the books, and I'm getting frustrated, you know, trying to be spiritual, studying, praying. So I pick up the house phone and I call my phone and I hear it ringing. And that's a sight in itself right there. <laughs> you know, it, it's an amazing thing how you'll search for something. And the Bible says, seek. I want you to, I want you to earnestly, diligently seek. That's what the shepherds did. In John and Luke 2, they came seeking Jesus. That's what Jesus did, Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's what God told us in Matthew 6, 6 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Search for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's what he's teaching us about prayer. He said in, in, John, uh, in Matthew 7, ask, get the acrostic, A-S-K, ask, and ye shall, what's the next word? Receive. Seek, and ye shall, that's what happens when you seek. Knock, and it shall be opened up to you. 
For he that asketh receiveth. And he that uh, uh, knocketh, it shall be opened to him. If a, son, if a father have a son and he, he asks for a bread, will he give him a stone? Or if a father have a son and he asks for a fish, will he give him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give to them that ask? Ask them. Seek him. God, God, God can give you what you want and say, well, I need a million dollars. Why is it always materialism that we need? Why don't we ask him and seek for, God, I'm seeking to be spiritual. I'm seeking to be godly. I'm seeking to know your will. I'm seeking to accept your will. God has a will. God has a desire. God has never made a mistake. And consequently, may we seek not to say, well, I, I just, I'm seeking for healing. I'm seeking, well, you know what? God may have other plans for our life. Not as I will, but thy will be done. Amen. And so he says, I want you to seek. Here's Jesus, and that sounds disrespectful. Here's our Lord, and, 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 and Jesus died and was put in a grave in a, Upon the first day of the week, they came to the sepulcher. Mary Magdalene and Mary, Matthew 28, verse 1. And they saw the stone is rolled away, and the angel sat there, and they said, he said, whom seek ye? That key word, seek ye. They came to seek Jesus. And the angel said, he is not here. Verse 6, he is risen, as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. They were seeking to come to the grave. Hebrews 11, 6, For without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You ever play hide and go? Hide and go? Yeah, what are you trying to, you're trying to find something. And whether it be lost keys or a lost phone or whatever, but God says, I want you to seek first the kingdom of God, Malachi 2.15. Seek for a godly seed. Are you, and he's talking about the home and the wife and the husband. Are you seeking a godly home? Are you seeking a home that is God-fearing? Or is everything about play and party and social media and video games, is, is that what the home's about? Or is it about a, a family, a, a mom and a dad and children or whatever the case might be? Is it, is it where you're, you're establishing a home? Maybe a mom's not in the home or dad's not in the home, but you still can have a family. Seek to have a godly home. And so we find that since we've been risen with Christ, we seek and then thirdly, set. Set your affection on things above. He already used that word above in verse 2. Verse 1, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, above, above. That word set is a real interesting word. You'll immediately think of something in your own life when I the word set means to gorge yourself. We think of food, don't we? Ice cream. Oh, my. I mean ice cream with caramel or butterscotch fudge on top. Is that what you call it, fudge? No, that's chocolate. Yeah, fudge. Ooh. And walnuts, Brother Carl. Walnuts. Oh, yes. And whipped cream. Now, that sounded pretty good right now, isn't it? Do you ever get a sweet tooth? I don't really don't have much of a sweet tooth, but once in a while, it gets out of control. Right now, before lunch, you know what sounds good right now, and I won't have it today? I'm talking about a steak about that thick. I'm talking about where the juice is still, not, not bloody red, but just the juice. Oh. Oh, man. And, and then you put a 15 pounds of sea salt on it, you know. They say that's healthy. Oh, oh. I'm, I'm, well, I'm going to stop this message in about two minutes. So I'm getting out of here. 
And then you have some vegetables with it. Not just one. I mean, you get corn, mashed potatoes, or a baked potato. Baked potato would be good. 15 pounds of butter, again. And some sour cream, chives. But then more than one vegetable or two. And some beans and some broccoli and some, you know, all the good stuff. Spinach, asparagus, a big old roll, five pounds of butter on that. I'm, I'm, this sounded good. No, not rice. <laughs> rice. This guy's always had problems. <laughs> but he's in therapy right now. He's going to, he'll, he'll make it. He'll make it. <laughs> you know, all of us probably once in a while could easily gorge ourselves. But that's what God wants me to do when I set, look what he says, your affections on things above. Not on things of this earth, not steak. Those are all good things. You you can't gorge yourself with prestige and position and portfolio and money. Those are all things that are down here. And everything that's down here is going to burn up. If I had money, boy, I'd buy a different car every six months. I love cars. I just love cars. I enjoy cars. I enjoy looking at cars. The 50s and 60s especially. I was up in Napa preaching several years ago after that big fire went through, and the pastor took me through the neighborhood where the houses were very expensive houses, and you saw all burned up down, all the way down, where all the houses lie in their big mansions of houses. And you see an old Porsche there. Or you see a restored Corvette there. All, all, no tires. It just burned up to a crisp. God says that's what he's going to do to planet Earth one day. That's why we lay not up for ourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal and destroy, but lay up for yourself treasure in heaven. God says, I want you to set your affection on things above. God wants us to think about heaven every day. God wants us to think of that entrance. You know, I read a book many years ago and I never knew really all that the preacher was saying until you get a little bit older in life. He was a godly, godly preacher. I forget the name, but I was reading in a book, and he'd been dead now probably for 50, 60, 70 years. But he said, I've served God with my life. And he was a big-name godly preacher. But he says, the closer I get, the more I reflect on my life and how unworthy I am to enter. And he said these words, Brother Remer, he said, it makes me want to, I'll never forget reading it, makes me want to crawl into heaven unnoticed. And though I've tried to serve God, that's exactly how I feel with my life. There could have been so much more that I've done with my life for God. But Jack Trevor gets in the way at times. Our self gets in the way. And please, please, I'm not saying never have vacation with your family. Certainly do that. Take days off with your family. Play ball with your family. But if we're not careful, we set our affection on things down here. I read an article this week about the Z generation. And I don't know about all the Zs and X. My wife, she's got it down detailed. And the, the characteristics of every generation but the Z generation is age 12 to 27. They say, oh, I'm 28. I didn't, I, I didn't make that. Well, you could be 28 too. That's just a general age group. They're saying they're discovering that that generation from 12 to 27 or 30 have no desire, no desire for work. They have no desire. They have absolutely no desire for responsibility. I don't want responsibility. They have no desire for work and responsibility for leadership. They have really no desire for career. 
And after now almost 30 years of the college, and we're producing, I, I saw in the last few weeks I've traveled across this country, different. I see our graduates out there serving, and now they're, 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 some of those boys have gray hair or bald heads, and, and some of those ladies have gotten a little bit older looking, and they have their children, or they have the grown children by them, you know, 30 years later almost. It's an amazing thing how, how, how many, many are faithful, dedicated, serving God. But it's amazing that we get college students, and I, I didn't know when I was a freshman, sophomore, junior, what God wanted me to do, but I did know that God wanted me to serve Him. I'm just shocked how many people go to college and have no direction, no work ethic. I am ashamed to tell you, I talked to our students about this, and I never thought it, because we, we get hired on at every company. We used to have job fairs because students would come here. And, and the companies realize they'll show up every day. They won't call in sick. They'll be here. They'll work. And they can pass the drug test. And it finally came. I could name the names of all the computer companies around. They would say, we don't need to. You just tell us who to hire. We'll hire them. Recently, we had one employer say, it used to be that way, but I can't hire all Golden State kids right now. They're careless. I came to our students. I said, that's not our heritage around here. And by the way, we've got the best college in America Amen. and the best kids. Yep. And right now, we have some freshmen in here, but sophomores, juniors, and seniors are out serving God in Sunday school. Sunday morning, they're preaching. They're running vehicles. They're singing the choir. They're doing all these things in the C ministry right now. They're amazing. They, they, they'll be a large part of helping us with the 100,000 door campaign this week. They're amazing. But we are inheriting a generation that do not know the eight parts of speech. Have never written a paper have never studied, have never had reading comprehension. Read a book and then can't tell you what any of it's about. We are living in an age where it's all about social media. One of our good members, he moved away from here and retired some years ago at age 44. And he said, Pastor, the wave of the future and I was in their state and I was preaching and he picked me up at the airport. He said, the wave of the future is video games. It was several years ago. I said, what parents will allow kids to just live on video games? He said, I'm not talking about children. I said, what are you talking about? He said, adults. I, I said, wait a minute, you're trying to tell me that adults are gonna be all enamored with playing video games? That's the generation we're writing for. I said, I, I don't believe it. Well, I was wrong. I, I don't know, I don't know, I, I, and it's not wrong, you're not a bad Christian if you know this, pro I probably should know this. I know nothing about Marvel. I, I don't know about who those Cartoon, I don't know what it is. But I tell you what, every adult, my hero is, I don't even know the names. And I'm not a better Christian than you. I'm not saying that. I don't know about all this. I don't know how, I can't wrap my head around how adults can get so wrapped up, wrapped up in cartoons or space, whatever it is. I don't know whatever it is. And I thank God for the fun you can have. But life is not about what can I do today for play. Set your affection on things above. Live to make it count forever. Yeah, I, I, I just, I know I'm part of a generation. I used to think I was kind of hip because I wasn't acting like my dad. You know what we're missing, Brother Tony? We're missing farms. You got up at four o'clock in the morning to milk the chickens, that's what you did. Chickens? Farmer Hannah? 
It's not chickens, right? You don't milk chickens. You milk the cows. But if you milk them at 4 o'clock in the morning, do you have to milk them later in the day? One more time. What time? 4 o'clock at night. Because their biological clock says, whatever time you did 12 hours later, I'm going to do this again. And they're going to eat green grass and produce white milk. Explain that one to me. I've never figured that one out. And some produce chocolate milk. That is really great. <laughs> That's wonderful. See, but, and you know, I hate, I really don't like it when, well, back in my day, no, so let me take you, back in my dad's day, it was the farm. And you got up twice, you got up in the morning and then at night, and you did your chores and you, and you gathered eggs from the chickens. Eggs in the morning, is that when they come in, Hannah? All right, okay. I know nothing about the farm. My dad did. But there's still a connection with that generation from the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s that put a desire in our hearts to do something. I'm not mad at teenagers and young people and young adults. I just know that a man that doesn't work can never be satisfied in life. God created us for work. There's fulfillment in work. There's joy in work. But when you work, don't set your affection on how can I get more? How can I get 35 cars restored and sit there? If you have 35 cars and you're listening, give me one. <laughs> and so since you're risen, seek those things and set your affection on things above. And today I want just simply as we look at the testimony of a true Christian, will you take inventory and will I take inventory? Of my sense because all this happened am I seeking the kingdom of God am I seeking God with all my heart and I'd have to say it's probably weak compared to what it should be so I'm not looking down on you and am I setting things is everything about above and in my life you deserve that as a pastor, you probably don't have it. Because sometimes, and I'm not saying you can't have fun, enjoyment in life. But sometimes we look at the end of the day, my attention's been here. Instead of here looking unto Jesus. I want to have prayer, but before we do, and there's no way I want to try to beat you up as your Christian life. Some of you have little babies and you're taking these baby steps. God bless you. I'll be preaching to a group of preachers this week. I'm just going to ask them if, and this sounds terrible because it should do more, will they pray out loud for 15 minutes a day? And next month, will they add another five minutes to it? And the next number, that, that we can get praying out loud to God for an hour a day. I'm afraid that many of God's men don't do that, so I'm not, I'm not here to judge them. And I'm not here to judge you, but I needed these words today. And you deserve me to live those words. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. The evidence, oh, are you a true Christian? And if you're not saved, let's get saved. Is everything a debate about the things of God? Father, speak to hearts, please, as you have this morning. Our heads are bowed. See, Pastor, I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I can go to heaven. Would you slip your hand up? No one looking. I know I'm saved. You may put them down. How many say, I, I'm not sure I'm saved, but would you pray I come to know Christ? Would you lift your hand? I need to be saved. I need to know heaven's my home. How many Christians just say, I'm coming up a little short on these responsibilities of my Christian life? Pray for me. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? I know hands are everywhere. Put them down. And someone encourages me. 
you're listening, you have tender hearts, it somewhat discouraged me because I don't want you thinking that your pastor looks at you a bunch of terrible Christians. The greatest Christians I know are sitting in this room right here. Here's what we'll do. In a moment, we'll stand. I'll complete my prayer. And then I'm going to ask you to come forward if you want to be saved or get right with God or pray about anything or have someone pray with you. The pastors are coming right now. Father, speak to our hearts in this invitation is my prayer. Our heads are bowed. Let's stand together, shall we? And as we stand together, the pianist plays. Will you start begin to come all across the house? Let's ask God to help you to be the Christian you ought to be, the Christian that will live for God. I'll baptize this morning and tonight. And so I'll ask that you listen to Brother Fanera. He's going to continue the invitation for us today. And we're just beginning it, Brother Fanera, so take your time, please. Are you saved? Do you know Christ? I think of how mad his life came to close so abruptly this week. You see, Brother Trevor, that's my age, or that's around my age. Why are you saved? If you died, would you go to heaven? Not did you join the church or give up alcohol or drugs. Are you saved? Are you saved? Do you know Christ? Brother Fanero is going to continue the invitation. Would you come right now? As the music plays, there's still time for you to come. I think if we'd be honest with ourselves this morning and perhaps take account of our life over this last week, we consider all the time that we spent. I wonder if our lives were made up, focusing our attention, spending our hours on how to gain more for ourselves in this life below. Or did we spend our time looking above, asking God, how can we do more for the cause of Christ? Perhaps you're like me this morning and God spoke to your heart and convicted you. And this week you want to give yourself, your time, your life to do more for the glory of God and to reach people. As we consider Easter ahead of us, I can't imagine a better way to celebrate the Easter holiday than by inviting people, by bringing people to God's house so they can hear the gospel. As the piano plays, maybe you want to come forward this morning and you want to pray for someone that you've invited, a friend, family member, a colleague, a neighbor, and you just want to come forward and pray that they would be faithful in God's house this Sunday. They may hear the, the gospel presentation and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Perhaps you have a need that you'd like to come forward and have one of the staff men or staff women pray with you about. If that's you this morning, feel free to come forward. No need to rush it. We have plenty of time. If God has spoken to you, will you come forward? Will you pray? The piano will continue to play for another moment or so. There's still time. Let's go ahead and let's pray together this morning. Our Heavenly Father, God, I'm so thankful for your man who stood and proclaimed the glorious truth, Lord, found in your word. God, I'm thankful that you put it on his heart. And God, I know in my own life I was convicted. God, it's so easy to get so enamored and wrapped up with the things of this earth. Hmm. Lord, in this week that lies ahead, may we focus our attention. May we set our affections on things above. Lord, and may we be reminded each and every day of the amazing gift of salvation that you gave to us, the price that you paid on Calvary. And Lord, may we do our very best. May we be compelled, Lord, to invite others to visit, to be in your house on Sunday, Lord, or Easter at the park on Saturday. Lord, may we be able to rejoice with a great multitude of people who come to this, the knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. 
Lord, I pray that we keep this truth in our hearts and in our lives throughout this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before we're seated, can we dismiss the bus workers and bus drivers if we've not dismissed you yet? You may be seated right there. Could you put your song books back so we're ready for tonight, please, where they belong? And that'd be great. Uh, I want to dismiss you in just a minute because we're not ready for baptism. We have an 83-year-old man that's been attending our young couples class. And we have God has used Brother Chiago and his wife to reach many Brazilians for Christ. We have 11 now coming Brazilians. And this couple comes, but we've been interpreting uh, the Sunday school lessons from English to Portuguese for them. And it's just a wonderful thing. And he's going back to Brazil, but uh, we've been, Brother Reamer's been witnessing to him with Brother Chiago. And he got saved, and he wants to be baptized. He said, I don't know if I'll go make it back to the United States, but I want to know that I'm saved, and I want to be baptized. I, I believe maybe his daughter's come as well. I'm not sure about that. But uh, we have others, and we're so thankful. I'm thankful you're here today. Balcony, it's a good crowd up there, the lower floor, wonderful crowd. And uh, I look forward to tonight. Uh, I trust you'll be here. We're still in that series on that subject of joy and what produces joy in our heart. I want you to have joy in a world that's just full of chaos. I want you to pray for this world this week that uh, as people celebrate Easter, that uh, they might realize that Christ is the answer. I was in another country preaching years ago, and uh, people all over the country were marching to a cathedral, big basilica. And as they marched there, you have to go, some go every year, but all over the country, all over, it's a small country, they walk. But the last five miles, or the last especially one mile, they crawl on their hands and knees, and the men take their shirts off, and the people on the sides of the road begin to whip them, and blood is pouring out all over the street because they want to make sure they can make it into entrance into heaven. That's not the way you go to heaven. It just saddens me to think how many churches have taught contrary to the Word of God. We're not ready here yet. We will be. And, uh, but I want to have you stand together. I'd like some of you, please, if you'll stand. I'd like to have some of our pastors. Pastor Everson, if you have time, will you go to the back door where I normally am? I'll be baptizing tonight as well. But I want to make sure I get to baptize these folks. I promised them I would. And uh, I love you folks so much. Oh, my goodness, what a joy to be your pastor. And thank you for all your labor already this weekend. And what's going to happen this week is we knock on 100,000 doors uh, to invite people to the special Easter Sunday. Let me just see here. We are ready for Would you like? I'd like you to see at least one. I'll continue to baptize. You're going to interpret to me. Have you asked Jesus to be your Savior? I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death. And raised in the likeness of his death. What a sweet, sweet man. God bless you. You are dismissed. Six o'clock tonight. Teachers meeting, vitally important. You are dismissed.